Throughout all the years that I've been making music, if you get on a tour bus with a bunch of musicians, eventually the conversation will go to Sparks. Hey everybody, this is TJR. And this is Superfan. And we just finished watching the motion picture documentary, The Sparks Brothers, which is a 2021 documentary available on Netflix, directed by Edgar Wright. The film is about Ron and Russell Mayle, uh, members of the pop and rock duo Sparks. And I would have to say that Sparks is the biggest band I've never heard of. But you, on the other hand, have been familiar with them for many years. Yes. In fact, when the tra- we first saw the trailer for it, we watched the trailer and I said, who is Sparks? And you said to me, cool places. And I said, cool places? And you pulled up the video. And I remembered that video that had uh, Jane Weidland, if I say her last name correctly, Weedland. from the Go-Go's. Weedland, thank you, from the Go-Go's. And I said, oh yeah, I remember that song. But that's all I really knew about them. And that was not a song that was like something I was into back then. I just, I remember hearing it. Yeah, I and was familiar I, with them for more than cool places. That was oh, of course. years into my awareness of them, although not as far back as they go. Yeah, they go back uh, to the early mid-70s. Mm-hmm. I would have to say, in fact, this is the first thing I'll pop off here with. We, I think we both agree with this. This band basically invented the 80s. I would say, yeah, they were the 80s before the 80s happened. When we think of the 80s, there were bands that came out during the late 70s that would be very influential to the 80s. But this band precedes them all. In some ways, yes. Yeah. So the surprising thing about this band, uh, for me, is that they've been around since the early mid-70s. They have released, um, what, how many albums was it? 20-something albums? I think 25. 24 to 25 albums. You can go ahead and look it up on the wiki. By the way, we should mention, or you, you, you noted, after we watched this movie, you looked up their wiki, and you said it's grown immensely since the last time you looked it up. It was previously very brief. Yeah. Now it's quite long. Yeah, I don't know why, but they popped into my head about a year ago, and I looked up mm-hmm. Sparks and their Wikipedia and the brothers individually, uh-huh. maybe a paragraph or two each. Yeah. And, and I'm, now... It's quite long. It's one of the longest Wikipedias I think I've ever seen. Probably because they've cribbed a lot of it from this film. I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, maybe so. So um, in this film, you have a lot of notable people back... Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols, uh, bands like Franz Ferdinand. Duran, uh, members of Duran Duran, Nick Rhodes and, and um, John Taylor. Joy, members of Joy Division, members of Erasure, Sonic Youth, along with producers like Giorgio Moroder and Tony Visconti, singing the band's praises, talking about them, their influence, Mentioning what a huge influence they've been on so many other bands and musicians. This film goes into their career and how they've never really ever, ever compromised to be commercial, which is why they're probably not as well known. I think what's impressive is they've never compromised for radio, yet they have stayed consistently true to themselves, continually writing and releasing music. Yeah, and the original band um, studio album that they released was initially released under the name Half Nelson. That was the name of the group at the time, Half Nelson, and then it became Sparks. They changed it to Sparks and re-released it because they thought that it would get more traction. Yeah. You, of course, have liked this band. You've enjoyed their music over the, over the decades. Yeah, I'm, I'm... I'm... I was completely oblivious. I we listened first... to some of it for the first time, or I listened to some of it for the first time, not just from this documentary, but um, just, you know, sampled some of it on streaming. Yeah. Um, it, we started listening to Kimono My House. Mm-hmm, which was one of their big albums. That was 1974. That was well before my uh-huh. awareness of them. And the thing that struck me the most was that it sounded like the 80s. Yeah. 
But it was 1974. I know. This was well before any of the late 70s bands that would become the 80s, like Elvis Costello or Devo, like once again, bands that came out in the very late 70s, but would be hugely uh, considered to be part of the 80s. And they're, of course, they're, they were very pioneering in the area of electronic pop dance music, which, by the way, is a musical genre that I personally have never been fond of. But I do recognize that a lot of people really like this music. And I can't, you know, I won't diss anybody for that. Yeah, there was one song on that album, and honestly, it's terrible. I cannot remember the title of the song, uh-huh. but it is the song that felt like Queen. Okay, and I just found it. The song is Falling in Love with Myself Again. Um, that song really, really reminds me of Queen. Uh-huh. Um, and... By the title, I think you can assume. That's one thing that kills me. I'm sorry, I don't mean to walk all over you, but that's one thing that killed me about this documentary was their song titles. Well, they have a sense of humor. Yeah, they have an amazing sense of humor. Weird Al Yankovic also is one of the uh, one of their fans who talks about them, and he brings up the point that I don't know why it is that music fans don't take you as seriously if you have a sense of humor about your art. And, you know, and I've always agreed with him on that. Just because something doesn't have a sense of, has just because something has a sense of humor doesn't mean you shouldn't take it seriously. I'm sorry I went off on a tangent there, but the song titles for their songs just killed me because well, they were so outrageous. The titles are just so outrageous that they make me want to hear the songs more. Because I think it's safe to say we both really enjoyed this movie. The movie has a quirky sense of humor to it. Yeah, I think it, it follows it, their musical sense of humor. It, it, shows it reflects that. it. It reflects it. Yeah, it reflects it. One thing I loved about this movie was all the little bits of animation. There's some 2D animation, there's 3D animation, but there's a lot of bits of animation used to illustrate different anecdotes in their past. And the two brothers are very open and honest about their lives, about who they are. Even though this band had a tremendous amount of mystique built up around them over the decades, they were incredibly open and not concerned with destroying the mystique that others may have had about them throughout this film with all the interviews they were doing. So much so that by the end of the film, after the closing credits, they do a gag where they actually say, we're afraid we may have destroyed some of our mystique, so we're going to tell you 10 facts about us that are absolutely true, that of course were absolutely bullshit. (laughs) And that were terribly funny. This was a really fun and very funny documentary. Yeah. Well, and I have to beg to differ with you, because Uh usually when you get a documentary like this, Uh it goes into details about personal lives. Uh Uh-huh. This was purely about the music and about their careers, not their personal lives in any, very, very little. Let me clarify. They, Go they ahead. like coffee. Let me clarify something. I think the difference between this band and a lot of other bands that may have come up during the 70s is they were not interested in indulging in decadence. They were interested first and foremost in just making music. So because they weren't interested in that, we don't have those dramas of drug and alcohol addiction with this band. We, these were, they are described by their, by their contemporaries and by their bandmates as being nice individuals, gentlemen, not huge egotistical narcissists, not individuals prone to temper tantrums. Frugal. Uh, Exactly. Frugal, yeah, or or Pennywise. When they were popular and they had a hit song, had maybe a hit song or two, they didn't throw that money away on mansions and cars and girls. They saved it for a rainy day, and as one of the uh, interviewees in the film describes, they had a period, a really dry period, of a number of years where they had years of rainy days when they were working nonstop but couldn't get any of their music released. That is why it is more about their music than any 
personal dramas dealing with drug and alcohol addiction as so many documentaries do. But what I'm saying is that they show themselves as themselves. You know, you feel like you're just sitting in the room there talking with them versus them trying to maintain any mystique, even though a lot of mystique was built up around them, simply because I guess they weren't hugely popular. So you didn't have a lot of press people trying to find out more about them and write stories about them. And people just probably develop their own mystique around them. Fans probably develop their own mystique around the band. So that's what I'm trying to say with that. Okay. Fair enough. Um, the th- I think the thing that surprised me most was that you had never really heard of, of Sparks other than Cool Places, the duet with Jane Weedland. Which was or, just a vague memory to me of the 80s. Just a vague memory. Yeah. Me of, like, well, that was one of those hits in the 80s that had a video and it was not my cup of tea at the time. I've since then I've re I've, I've re listened after seeing that trailer before watching the movie I listened to Cool Places and thought yeah that is a fun little song I like that song but uh, yeah I'm, I you know like I said don't know why I'd never really heard of them or familiar with them they clearly are a band that was influential to a lot of musicians um, and and they were all over the place in LA in the eighties and that is another reason that I'm kind of surprised yeah. That, I, I mean, I know I saw them live at Magic Mountain. You saw everybody live back in the 80s. Well, I of worked course, at a record store. You so were going to shows almost every single day, I remember. There was a year and a half where I went to at least three shows a week. Yeah, yeah. That must have been great. It was. <laughs> but, yeah, expensive, I'm not sure. Sh- but great. Not I'm, as expensive as it would be now, but. I'm not sure why. And I'll be honest, as I listened to clips of their songs during this documentary, a lot of it was not musically clicking with me, with my sensibilities. And I told you this as we watched, and you said, well, you're, you don't like the weird stuff. I said, no, that's not true. I like, Beck has done all kinds of weird stuff outside of his mainstream stuff that I've really liked. And there are other artists, you know, I've, I've liked weird stuff from Frank Zappa, but there's different types of weird. But sometimes weird is something you have to hear more than once before you really can know and understand if you like it. So maybe I just need to hear some of it more. And I, like I said, we're watching a documentary where there's only just these, these shorter clips. Um, but I, yeah, I think I do want to try to delve a little deeper and find out a little bit more. Certainly some of these titles just alone are enough to make me want to listen. The lyrics in, themsel- in and of themselves are an experience, and I think that that's something that needs to be explored, too. But I would want to ask anybody watching this video if they want to recommend a particular songs or albums that might be a good place to start. This band has, like like you said, roughly about 20-some albums. 25. Wow, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but that's also amazing to have such a creative output. And over such a lo- after so many decades, with no sign of slowing down, uh, that's just amazing. Uh, we should all be so productive in our lives. But definitely, I really enjoyed this musical documentary in a way that is unlike any other, in my opinion. This was one of the most enjoyably fun music documentaries I've ever seen, whether or not you are familiar with this band, because I wasn't, and whether or not you even like this kind of music, this is... One hell of a fun music documentary to watch. Yeah. So I would recommend it to anybody. To give people an idea, 25 albums. The Rolling Stones have released 30 studio albums. Uh Uh-huh. And the Mail Brothers are showing no signs of slowing down, but then again, neither are the Rolling Stones. Um, Well, that might be debatable. Anyway, that's another topic. We won't get into that. (laughs) Well, they're still releasing albums, so... Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Slowly. Uh, there's one in the works. Um, it may be their last for all we know. Uh, but at any rate, though. Um, so, yeah, once again, I just want to recommend this movie. I'm sure you do, too. Yes. And yes. let us know if you've seen this. Let us know if you're a Sparks fan. Let us know if you're not a Sparks fan. But let us know if you've seen this movie and what you think. It's available on Netflix, which most people have. And which, like I said, you can always subscribe for a month and then cancel if you that's what you want to do. But let us know what you think. I really loved this movie and I would even watch it again. It was so much fun. And so I should, but I should spend that time trying to listen to some of their music and seeing what I really think and taking a deeper dive. 
But everybody, thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hope you all stay safe and healthy. This is TJR saying goodbye. This is Superfan saying goodbye. Hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.